I hate the idea of eating a potato like an apple. I mean, I guess it's so I like it's really bad if you're like definitely if it's raw, but it's worse in a different way if it's a hot baked potato because it's like you uh, there's some sort of sadism there. Sadism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the other one? S- masochism. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that is it. I mean, truly, <laughs> I'm done after that. <laughs> yeah, that we is... can't really talk to each other anymore now that now that we've said that. It's good to start off our podcast on a real PG note. Yeah, I, you know it's going to be a family episode when we're talking about S and M right <laughs> off the bat. <laughs> oh. And I like that they're that they'd be coming into a conversation about S and M, so they do like, really have no like, context. Like they opened the door and heard this conversation and yeah. walked back out and closed the door. <laughs> it's not what you think. No, no, no. Wait, it's just butter, no parsnips. Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Kyle Imperator and Emily Moyers take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. It's just butter, no parsnips. That's hey. all. BNP, different than S and M. BNP, not S and M. Similar. I'm EJM, <laughs> and I'm KVI coming at you live. That's right. Emily and Kyle here with another episode, and this is a this is a Kyle episode. It is a Kyle episode, and for this Kyle episode, I have what Emily? Uh, a word. <gasps> yes, I do. <laughs> Do I get the victory music for that? Yep, play the victory music. (laughs) uh, Have the ending, you know, music play. The ending, that's it? Roll the credits? Yeah. (laughs) Join our Patreon uh, at (laughs) SNM. Whatever. Don't stop. (laughs) Um, No, Emily, I have a word for you today. And I'm, like, really excited about it. And I hope you are, too. Are you excited about it, Emily? I'm so excited about it. I don't, I'm not really quite convinced of that based you know, on You guys your keep response. saying when I say stuff, you're like, I feel like I don't believe you. This is just how I talk, you guys. Oh, gosh. We got to fix that, huh? I am excited. You always pick good words. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, we'll see. I mean. I know. <laughs> Emily, your word today is eurythmic. Oh. It is spelled E-U-R-H-Y-T-H. M I C. It can also be spelt without that first H. Sure. If that makes things easier for you, I'm, I'm sure that'll get you to the right answer. I mean, my initial thought is it means one half of the band. Are they a duo? The, the band. They are a duo. Eurythmics. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, if you if you have one eurythmic, <laughs> one eurythmic, <laughs> it is. It's either Annie Lennox or was it? Dave Stewart is the other one. Is that wow? I mean, you've already surpassed me in your rhythmics knowledge. So well, I mean, I well did done. have to. I did have to look into them when I did Just this work. I couldn't I ignore said exactly them. that. <laughs> yes, you said Emily's going to go for the low hanging fruit here. <laughs> I mean, that's literally what I thought when I looked into this word. So sure. I mean, is it music related or rhythm related? Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. It's an adjective, if that helps. Sure. Okay, right. I forgot that the word it wasn't eurythmics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it isn't eurythmics, and it isn't a eurythmic. It is the adjective, eurythmic. So something is eurythmic. Correct. So, like, my immediate thought is that this is describing, like, sound waves or, like, some kind of wavelength-related thing. Yeah, that's not true. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, the definition of eurythmic is harmonious. Oh, sure. Also meaning having a pleasing rhythm, order, proportion, or structure. You know what? That makes so much sense because the EU is like Mm -hmm. euphoria it is like euphoria emily just like the tv show it's about angsty drug addled teens 
played by 20 year olds. Yes. And Zendaya is there. Yeah. And I'm sure she's harmonious and could be the third Eurythmic member. <laughs> could be the third Eurythmic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Honestly, that would sound great. Anyway, move on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emily, the word Eurythmic comes from, who could have guessed, the noun Eurythmy. Oh. Which first appeared in English in 1624. Spelled with a Y? Spelled, yeah, which is like the quality of being harmonious. Yeah. That comes from the ancient Greek word eruchmia, Ooh. which means rhythmical order. And of course, the two parts of that are the first part, which is eu, which meant well in ancient Greek. That come from came from the Greek word eus, meaning good or brave or noble. Oh. And the second half of that is shrutmos. Shroot moss. Shroot moss, which is how you would have said rhythm or f- proportion back in ancient Greece. Crazy that shroot moss l- like linguistically evolved to rhythm. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I was looking into like ancient Greek pronunciations and stuff and they just there's like a lot with like aspiration before letters and stuff like that sure so i don't like it there's like a difference between like rough aspiration and like soft aspiration so i don't know i found some guy who said it like this i was like eh, we'll go with that (laughs) you know (laughs) that's how we do most of our research here anyway Uh, yeah if one guy said it that way Good enough for me. (laughs) Good enough for me. So, Emily, you're not going to believe this, right? I bet I will. Well, I mean, hopefully I can convince you. (laughs) The origin of Eurythmy lies in the world of architecture. Oh. Mm. Like harmonious architecture? Uh, Yes, exactly like that. (laughs) Sure. So the word was first used by the Roman architect Vitruvius in his treatise De Architectura, meaning on architecture, which was probably written between 30 and 20 BC. Wow. Have you read it? You sound like you're familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. I've got it on my bookshelf. Let me just pull it out, dust it off. Yeah, I'm sure it's got like notes in the margin and everything. Yeah, I I wrote it up. (laughs) Yeah. Well, good. So then you can answer this question, Emily. Uh, In it, Vitruvius, yeah, Vitruvius lists the six fundamental principles of architecture. What are they? Oh, the six fundamental principles of architecture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Ready? Number one. Yeah. Yeah. Walls. Number two. Floors, three ceilings, four doors, oh. five oh. windows, okay, yeah. six uh, 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 cupolas. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's <laughs> okay. You need to have those. That's one, have, of the, one of the fundamentals. He got to cupolas before roofs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like whether you're building a preschool or you're building, you know, uh, you know a, a, a beach house. <laughs> yeah, McDonald's. Gotta have cupolas. (laughs) Gotta have a cupola. Close, Emily. The six fundamental principles of architecture, as Vitruvius sees it, are ordinatio, dispositio, eurythmia, symmetria, decor, and distributio. Which, of course, you know the translation. I don't even have to say it. I mean, I think I figured it out for most of them. Oh, yeah. It was ordin- ordinance. There's no direct translation for any of them, but True. that one's been translated to order. So you could yeah. go with ordinance. Order. The second was, was dispositio. Position? I don't know. Yeah. Arrangement is how people have translated that. Sure. And then eurythmic was mm-hmm. the next one. And symmetria. Symmetry. Mm-hmm. And decor. And decor. Yeah. That's been translated as like decorum so like propriety and the last one was uh, distributio that can be translated to uh, yeah economy like usefulness of what you're doing so the ancient greek used the term techne to refer to the mechanics or the craft of something and it explained their perception that craft was a practical application of art so the ancient greeks believed in learning a craft learning the mechanics of something to then put it towards making art it wasn't uh just art for art's sake they didn't like the idea of that you know what i mean Sure. No Ulipo. No Ulipo. Yes, they were <laughs> anti-Ulipo <laughs> in ancient Ulipo. Greece. Yeah. So here, the definition of Eurythmy for Vitruvius is that cozy feeling that you get when you look at a structure 
that has had its craft applied to it to make it beautifully well proportioned. When everything's just like neat as a pin. Uh, yes. Well proportioned is is kind of how he defined symmetrical. It wasn't like how we think of it today, where it's like one side matches the other. Emily, I can't tell you how much information I learned about <laughs> architecture that I couldn't put in this episode because it would be so boring. So <laughs> We're not going to go any further than that. We're going to talk about some other things. <laughs> so for Vitruvius, Emily, and for many others of his time, your rhythm is reliant on imitation of the human body. Oh. Yeah, because he felt that the proportions of the human body were like God's proportions. You know, th- it was the perfect proportions in the world. And so all art and architecture should imitate that. So one might think of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man drawing. Right. You know, with the with, with the, the circle arms. and the yeah. yeah, and the arms. That's one of the many artistic representations of Vitruvius's ideal proportions of the human body. It gets applied to buildings through the actual proportions of the human body. So he would say the head is one sixth of the body in total. So you should divide certain parts of a building into sixths. So there should be like six columns, you know what I mean? Or or, or something should be spaced evenly six apart. Gotcha. And then, you know, the, the length of your arms, you know, your arm is usually the length of your, you know, uh, torso or whatever. So that's how they would, you know, determine proportions and architecture through the body. Gotcha. Make sense? Sure. In Peter Lee's 1831, The Music of the Eye, which was the first book to use eurythmic as an adjective, Lee oh, talks at length- That's a big length- time jump. I, that's a big time jump, right? 1624 <laughs> to 1831? Well, but didn't you say like something BC? <laughs> well, that's where eurythmy, the Greek word, eruchmia, Originated. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm caught up. So he ta- Lee talks at length about Vitruvian proportions, but my favorite quote in this book is when he says, But from the length of a man's foot, which is one sixth of the height of his body, the people in the days of Vitruvius must have had very large feet, for a man six feet high now is very seldom a foot twelve inches long. And I really like to think he's like compensating for something like, are you sure it's supposed to be that? (laughs) Everybody has it that long? I don't think everybody's got (laughs) it that long, right? 12 inches, that sounds a lot. Foot insecurity. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, real foot insecurity. (laughs) So that's that's Peter Lee in his book. Uh, Now Now that was the first use as an adjective? As opposed to eurythmy? His book, he uses... Oh my God, Emily. <laughs> Again, I, ta- I, I read so much about architecture and eurythmy and symmetry and what the difference is. I still don't really understand because it's <laughs> made up. I had a whole section of this that I had to cut that was me realizing that based on one of the reviews of his book, that his whole book might have been tongue-in-cheek. So I really <sighs> don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> So I'm just go. I'm just going with the flow, you know. So funny. Yeah, <laughs> it's all a lie. Uh, yeah, it was. It's crazy, and I wish I could talk about that, but I've got so many more better things to talk about. Oh, I'm so glad. So in his opening, Lee talks about the connection between architecture and music. He says. The music of the ear is the art which treats of the harmony of sounds. Why may not, therefore, the art which treats of the harmony of visible objects be called the music of the eye? We learn from Hesychius and other lexicographers that musike and techne, music and art, were among the Athenians' synonymous words. And that's true. Music was an extension of craft for the Athenians and for Greeks at large. Sure. I get that. Yeah, it was like they saw it more as like the mechanic side of art. Sure. You know? That's yeah. tr- there is a lot of like math involved. A lot of math relating to proportions, perhaps. Hmm? Sure. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're getting somewhere. We're getting Relative somewhere. Relative pitch and all that. So, shroot moss, which isn't a Pokemon. <laughs> shroot moss, which means rhythm in ancient Greek, referred right. literally to a repetition. So in music and dance and poetry, this repetition, this rhythm is temporal, right? It's time-based, 
So the Greek philosopher Aristoxenus of Tarentum, which I swear is a real Greek philosopher, (laughs) he expressed in his Elementa Harmonica the concept of rhythmic proportions, beats as a part of a larger whole. Like beats in a measure? Yes. But so like how the fact that they're identical, but a proportion of the measure. So this is likely where Vitruvius, who extensively quotes this work, finds spatial rhythms in art and architecture, measured proportions as a part of a whole building or artwork. Yeah. See the connection there? Yeah. Yeah. I do. Vitruvius connects music to architecture pretty often in De Architectura. He's got a couple of like really interesting bits that I want to bring up. He describes his plan for sound amplification in theaters, which is to install giant bronze vases amongst the seating that resonate at different pitches. (gasps) Crazy. So he's like, I'll get every pitch just so that like no matter what is being said, it'll resonate somewhere. It'll resonate somewhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> crazy. Is that crazy? And the last thing that he talks about is he explains the importance of being able to tune catapult strings to the correct pitch in the midst of battle so that the catapults throw straight and hit their target. Sure. That makes so sense. like in the sense that it's important for soldiers to have good internal pitch, which is like a wild thing you would never think of. We're now going to fast forward to 1905. (gasps) Enter Austrian-born Swiss composer Emil Jacques Dalcroze. (laughs) Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so Dalcroze felt that music education of the time was too abstract. It was academic, cerebral. It was like people, kids and adults alike, weren't able to connect with it, you know? So as a teacher, he noticed that some of his students couldn't play in rhythm, but were naturally walking in time and could tap their feet or shake their heads to the beat as like a physical response to listening to music. Realizing this... He combined these responses to music with intense listening in order to develop a set of methods and principles which he termed, can you guess? Eurythmics? Eurythmics, Emily, you got (laughs) it! (laughs) What a relief. (laughs) It's called Eurythmics. It can be called Dalcro's Eurythmics, named after him, of course. And it focuses on three main concepts— which are? Uh, walls, <laughs> floors, <laughs> uh, windows. <laughs> so the, the first part of Dalcro's Eurythmics is solfege, you know, ear training. He believed that everyone was capable of perfect pitch through enough training. No. For those of you at home who aren't musically inclined, that basically means being able to find a certain note out of the air, out of thin air. And from what I know, it's not possible for anyone yeah. to do it unless you get <laughs> you it at a young it. age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, some people can. Uh, yeah. The second part of Eurythmics is improvisation was an important tenant. This was, and not like improv comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I got yeah. that one. Scenes from a hat, <laughs> 1905. Scenes what from would a that hat, be 1905. Like? It's a, well, it's a very dapper hat first yeah of all. stove stovepipe stovepipe stove pipe, pipe. <laughs> top pipe top to- <laughs> stove what's it called <laughs> i think it's stovepipe it doesn't sound right um it does okay stovetop <laughs> stovetop <laughs> stuffing <laughs> still's a cooked hat <laughs> yeah so improvisation that aspect was influenced by his friendship with the psychologist Edouard Claparade. You're nailing these names. I don't know. Maybe. Um, (laughs) I've practiced a lot. (laughs) They sound great to me. Uh, Thanks. Claparade studied memory loss. And one of his like, well, most well-known studies is one where he, he studied a woman with amnesia and he would greet her every morning by shaking her hand and she wouldn't remember him. But then one day he put a pin in his hand and shook her mm-hmm. hand, and she was like, ow, ooh, that hurt. And then the next day, she greet- he greeted her again. She didn't recognize him, but when he reached his hand out, she, like, hesitated before grabbing his hand. 
Yeah, that's conditioning. Yeah. He was like, clearly this shows that while she has memory loss, like there's still some sort of like physical response that is separate from the memory loss. Yeah. And I guess that plays into the whole, you know, physical, instinctual reacting to music part of Dalcro's as Eurythmics. Sure, 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 sure. And then the the last part of Eurythmics is Eurythmics, which (laughs) is expressing music through movement. This can take the form of uh, associating rhythms or music with specific movements before introducing the actual terminology. So like with little kids, when you're trying to teach them quarter notes, you might call them walking notes and have them walk on the beat. And you might call eighth notes running notes and have them run on those before you then teach them what the actual terminology is. That makes sense? Sure. Uh, Another game could be passing a ball in different ways, um, uh, you know, to try and get the the motion of passing the ball, uh, you know, embedded in you differently. One of them is called the cosmic whole note game, which is you listen to a pulse that's so slow that you you have to try and predict the next note and like the more that you do that like the better you get like develop your internal sense of rhythm i guess sure that's That's gonna be your game at the end of this episode emily it's just gonna be (laughs) oh my god (laughs) and this can build up to using movement to choreograph to music um usually in a student performance setting for Eurythmics. It's not usually performed as a full performance. It's usually just like to show what a student has learned. Delcro says of rhythmic proportion, which he translated as temperament, music in the Greek sense of the word is the art in which temperament is most concretely manifested. I like that he's also talking about like music in, in ancient Greece, you know, it kind of brings yeah, us back. That was a very lovely turn of phrase. <laughs> but he also talked about how the union of nations can be brought about through the open exchange of unique national rhythmic ideas. Oh, wow. He's, he's, he's going straight to world peace. He was. He really was. He was introduced to Arab folk music at some point. And he was like, wow, this is different, but like internalized for this culture and you know each culture has kind of has their own like internalized rhythm like we can build on this and make unity in the world (laughs) he wanted one unified rhythm which is the opposite (laughs) (laughs) i want us all to get to one beat (laughs) just he's like look at all this diversity and culture what if i blended it all into one Yeah, no, he was he was he wanted other cultures to learn about rhythm by by learning about other cultures rhythms. Sure, sure, sure. Um, uh, And yeah, so he's got this great style of writing. It's at the same time conversational, but also oratorical. And it sounds like a line from uh, Modern Major General. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> I am the modern major. I am the major Ooh. general. I don't even remember how it starts when I so sang that funny. damn song. <laughs> I mean, he, the way he writes, it it really makes you want to like get up and do something about what he's talking about. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, I can make a difference here. Oh my god, I have to compose an <laughs> opera. Yeah, I, this is most evident in uh, a piece he wrote called "The Young Lady of the Conservatoire and the Piano." In this piece, he has a conversation with a fictional Mr. So-and-so about Uh how that man's daughter's passing piano grade isn't proof of musicianship. Yeah, I mean, sure, that stands to reason. (laughs) Yeah, so he's like, just because she can play the piano doesn't mean she's good at music. And, like, has a full-blown argument with this non-existent man. But he, Emily, he, like, really gives him, like, he rags on him. He gives him the third degree. And... At, at one point, he starts questioning Mr. So and So's love for his wife, oh, he's Madam So and So. Of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, what what else would she be named? If she right. Was what, Mr. what else? So and So's wife. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, wow. why are you having this argument with a, a, a <laughs> like? What is the point of manufacturing this argument? The best part is the whole piece culminates in this exchange between Mr. So and So and Dalcros. And what will become of children absolutely antipathetic to music? Oh, they'll have to be eliminated. <gasps> <laughs> what? And it's just like, what does that mean? 
I, I'm not as on board with this man as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he doesn't mean destroyed. He just means that <laughs> they shouldn't be musicians. <laughs> I mean, it definitely sounded like he meant destroyed. I mean, it does sound like that, but I'm going to chalk <laughs> it up to it being like 1912 when he wrote it, you know? Sure, sure. Everybody was just blasting each other in those <laughs> just, days. Just blasting each other, especially kids, you know? Yeah, yeah. Just get rid of them. We have, we have them in batches of like 12 anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Dal Croza's work has been incredibly influential, Emily. Not only is Dal Croza's Eurythmics what, still today one of the major educational tools for music uh, at all levels, it also acted as the impetus for other me educational me methodologies that are st also still used today. The best part of Dal Croza, though, and his whole Eurythmics thing is that his students performed Eurythmics in the first art competitions at the 1912 Summer Olympics in Stockholm, Emily. What? Yeah, can you believe it? I can't. That I cannot believe. The other thing <laughs> yeah. I believed, but this is... <laughs> Prove it. Uh, well, can you believe that they did not place? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I think there were only three performers and they just gave out a gold medal. They didn't even so, give the others. Medals. So crazy. <laughs> they could have. <laughs> the gold medal went to some Italian composer who wrote like a fanfare for the Olympics. I could not find a recording of it anywhere, nor had so, I ever heard of the composer. Wait, what was the event? It was like music like the music event at the Olympics. So they had like a huh. series of art competitions. Interesting. And music was one of the events. Was that unique to that Olympics or were they doing that for a while? They did it for like three. Actually, I feel like they did it for a while until like the 30s or 40s maybe. And then they were like, this is, doesn't make any sense. We should stop doing this. Well, but they also stopped the Olympics because there was a world war. <laughs> uh, speaking of that world war, Emily. Uh, yeah, it was a good one. It was a, it was a great one, <laughs> depending on which one we're talking about. I'm going to switch gears one more time, Emily, and I'd like to talk about a contemporary of Dal Crow's. At the same time that Dal Crow's was developing his Eurythmics, the Austrian philosopher Rudolf Steiner was developing his own philosophies. Hmm. Oh. As a child, Steiner believed he was visited by the spirit of his dead aunt. And by Ooh. age 15, he believed that he had gained a complete understanding of the concept of time, which he felt was the precondition for his eventual oh. clairvoyance. And this is connected to Eurythmic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I can't wait for you to see how. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going crazy. <laughs> So in 1912, Steiner formed the Anthroposophical Society for studies in his esoteric philosophy, Anthroposophy. Anthroposophy? Anthroposophy. Is that like the study of just all of it? <laughs> so Anthroposophy focuses on putting logical reasoning and the scientific method towards proving spiritual matters. Sure. Anthroposophists believe humans can access a real objective spiritual world through rigorous forms of ethical and cognitive self-discipline. Uh, less sure, but I'm along <laughs> for the ride. <laughs> okay, yeah. Steiner himself called anthroposophy spiritual science, and they, they tried to, like, pass it off as a science. It's like, yeah, this is science, <laughs> but for spirits. And people were like, yeah, but that makes it not science. <laughs> and he was like, no, it's, it's science, but for spirits. And they're like, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> I mean, Kyle, I feel like we're going to get some polarizing in our listeners now. <laughs> I, I mean, definitely the anthroposophists. So, <laughs> so Steiner used his philosophy as an umbrella for a litany of philosophical and social pursuits. I'm going to talk through some of them just so you get an idea of what anthroposophy is about. Right? Just, a, and, just a quick skim. Yeah, he, he did so many things. <laughs> One of the things that he created is called biodynamic agriculture. It's an alternative form of agriculture that incorporates astrology and specialized soil treatments to improve the ecosystem. With astrology? <laughs> With astrology. Like, one of the things is, okay, 
at a certain time of the year, you should bury a cow's horn filled with oh, powdered quartz good. for yep. better crop yield. Yes, I do that every year, actually. Yes, right. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. That's why your times begonias horn, are so beautiful. Yes, my begonias are uh, uh, not to be beat. And if anyone tries, I put cow's blood in their garden. Oh, God. <laughs> Another thing that he founded, I guess, is something called anthroposophic medicine. Oh, I don't like where this Th is going. <laughs> you won't. It was developed in conjunction with Ita Wegman, who I'm going to wait so you can make a joke about that because that name I just realized is hilarious. <laughs> I would never, Kyle. I am, I'm, I'm, I would never stoop so low. I will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so hungry I could eat a Wegman. <laughs> Kyle's canceled again. This is what she's most well known for, Emily. Okay. She's most well known for her controversial cancer treatment using mistletoe extract. It was originally called Iskar. It's now circulated under the name Iskador, which Steiner believed could cure cancer by absorbing etheric forces and strengthening the astral body. Okay, I take it back. I'm so hungry, I could eat a Wegman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it should be noted that Although this treatment has been widely circulated up to today in Europe and especially oh, no. in Germany, German-speaking countries, that this treatment is not supported by organizations like the uh, American Cancer Association or the FDA. And I believe many or at least a few Swiss cancer associations have come out recently and been like, stop taking this. <laughs> Another of his endeavors was something that he called Waldorf schools, which are... Beside the Statler schools? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Those were Dalcroze's schools. <laughs> Waldorf schools are a series of private institutions for children of all ages. They now have buildings numbering over 1,200 worldwide. Wow. And they educate students on fundamentals through an anthroposophic lens. Yikes. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, it should... It, it is obvious that these institutions have their own detractors for a number of reasons, which I also cannot get into today. Sure. We'll be here all night. And it's fun to know that Steiner himself was also an architect. In 1913, he be began construction on a building in Dornach, Switzerland, to be the center of activity for anthroposophists. And he named that building the Goetheanum after the Ooh. poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, from whom he gained much of his philosophical inspiration. I mean, we love a bit of Goethe. We love a bit of Goethe. I don't know how much we love it through the Steiner lens, but... No, but I do love that Steiner's bringing Eurythmics back around to architecture. Yes, and here, let's get, let's get to the Eurythmic portion of Steiner. Oh. You ready? I'm ready. In 1911, Steiner was introduced to a young woman named Laurie Smits, who was looking for advice on starting a career in dance. So Steiner suggested she just make up her own dance movement <laughs> art. Heck yeah. Just do like, don't learn the other people's stuff. Do your own thing. You do you, girl. Live your truth. <laughs> so together with Smits and his wife, Marie von Zievers, the three Smits of them studied- Smits and Zievers. Smits and Zievers and Steiner. <laughs> the three of them studied human anatomy and Greek sculpture to create a new form of dance, which they termed Eurythmy. Wow. This is completely a separate thing from Eurythmics. Gotcha. They just borrowed the word. I think they also got it from the ancient Greek. So unlike Eurythmics, Eurythmy focuses more on the performance aspect. So Eurythmists utilize hand and body gestures to express specific aspects of melody, harmony, and rhythm of music and speech, such as the rising and falling of pitches, the changing quality of chords, or the mouth sounds of spoken language. And they do all of this hmm. in an effort to express the spiritual world in the objective world. Sure. I mean, I bet that looks very nice to have like a visual representation of the music. Absolutely. I bet that's cool. Eurythmy is also notable for its strikingly simple costumes, which are usually straight floor length dresses of a single color adorned with a silk veil. And the choreographers utilize these 
dresses to convey different moods by having the performers come on and leave at different times. And it would be good to note here that the Gertianum performed Eurythmy at the Paris Expo of 1937-1938, but unlike their Dalcro's counterparts, they <laughs> took home the gold medal for Best Modern Dance Act. That's right. <laughs> so they've won today they've won yeah that, that's they've they've won this episode <laughs> little did you know it's a competition between all the historical figures we mention in our episodes <laughs> oof uh, you're not gonna like how this ends then <laughs> So, like Dalcro's, Steiner's work has influenced a wide range of individuals, such as the abstract painter Wassily Kandinsky and oh. the influential art film director Andrei Tarkovsky. For you, Emily, I'll also note that Steiner's philosophical work, Anthroposophy, was a huge inspiration for Owen Barfield. Does that name ring a bell to you? Not in the slightest. Well, he was the mentor <laughs> of the writers J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Oh, wow. So in a kind of Kevin Bacon six degrees way, (laughs) the anthroposophy was an influence for pretty much all of modern fantasy literature. Yeah, all fantasy. (laughs) Yeah. Including mine. That's right. I forgot you studied directly with J.R.R. Tolkien. (laughs) I did. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, Emily, I'm going to end on this. I believe it is important to note this of Steiner's beliefs for our audience. All right. Listen up, audience. Listen up, okay? I know you you all tuned out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So anthroposophists view evolution in the opposite direction of Darwin. This means that they believe that all animals have devolved from an early unspecialized form. Oh. Yeah. So we're getting worse. Humans are the least devolved, are the closest to this early unspecialized form. So, no, we're not getting worse. Oh. So his theory that is that like all animals started off like more civilized? He believes that all animals were one thing that everybody has devolved from and humans have branched off but only devolved just a little bit. Right, but like apes came from an ancestor that was as t- as intelligent as yes. humans or more? More. Interesting. Yes. That's cuckoo mm-hmm. bananas. Mm-hmm. So it can be said, Emily, that Steiner's views on race were just a little complicated, right? Uh-huh. So while he was fiercely critical of racial prejudice and anti-Semitism, which drew intense ire from the Nazi party and Adolf Hitler in particular, who very much hated Steiner and his beliefs, Steiner still believed in a hierarchy of races with whites at the top. And a few leading members of the Nazi party, like the adjunct Fuhrer Rudolf Hess, were ardent supporters of anthroposophy, which is probably why anthroposophists weren't major targets of the Nazi party during World War II. Sure, and probably why they won that art award. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. It's actually all starting to add up now. (laughs) Emily, to wrap all this up in a nice, neat little bow, Steiner's Eurythmy was born independently just six years after Dalcroze crystallized his Eurythmics. Both men born in the Austrian Empire, both men moving to Switzerland to build educational careers, but clearly branching off in wildly different directions. Isn't it history just freaking insane? (laughs) (laughs) It absolutely is. You are correct in that regard. Good, I'm glad. Emily, having learned all about Eurythmic, could you use it in a sentence? Boy, it's that's honestly (laughs) a good question. (laughs) Yeah, I know it is. Because this whole time, I'm still just thinking about the band. (laughs) Wow. It's just playing straight through in your head. (laughs) Truly. Every time you segue into a new topic. Everybody's looking for something, huh? (laughs) I was like, is this going to segue back (laughs) into the band? (laughs) No. I had nothing interesting to say about the band because they- That's so fair. Annie Lennox was literally just like, I did Eurythmics in school and it sounded like Europe and Rhythm. So that's how we got the name. (laughs) Truly. It's like, okay, sure. But to use Eurythmic in a sentence, I was admiring the building because it had such a Eurythmic quality to it. 
Is that I it? think that is, works perfectly. It, it's a little bit of a cop out, but I think I think that it's an appropriate usage of that word. Thank and you. it includes architecture. So thank you, Emily. You C- listen minus. at least to the first 30 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Emily, I think we've got about 45 minutes left for this podcast, so it's time for a game. (laughs) Oh, it's a 45-minute game? It's a maxi game? So, Emily, this minigame's called You Good? Emily, we we now know that the prefix E-U, you, means good or well. Yeah. That's well established. It's you established. It's you established. So I'm going to give you some literal translations of words that begin with EU, and you're going to have to guess what that word is. Oh, okay. I like this. This Got is a it? fun game. Cool. So your first clue is good words. Are these real words? Yes, real words. Uh oh. No. <laughs> I you, thought we were talking oh, about makeup eulogy? words for the rest of eternity. Yeah, eulogy, <laughs> Emily. You got it. Yeah. Wow. Hey, nice. Okay. Sweating. Yeah, so a <laughs> eulogy is... Jeez. <laughs> so eulogy means the speech given at a funeral to honor the deceased. And the logy part comes from the Greek logos, meaning that which is said or thought. Sure. Your next clue is... Uh-huh. Good sound. Good sound. Gulp. <laughs> you Vox. You Vox. And U-vox. Emily, tell me, could you just describe to our audience what a U Vox is? U Vox is a, uh, I think, a brand of speakers, probably. <laughs> probably somewhere. If not I don't now, know this one. before we release this episode, we're going to make it a thing. <laughs> the answer is euphonium. Euphonium. Oh, that's mm-hmm. the instrument, right? That's the instrument. It's like yeah, a yeah, smaller yeah. tuba, like a, a euphonium. Tuba. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it comes from the Greek phone, meaning sound. Gotcha. Uh, your next clue is well covered. Kyle, where are you getting these made up words? They're real words. <laughs> the last two were definitely <laughs> real words. <laughs> you remarked and you said, oh, like the instrument. <laughs> Really, the problem is that I can only think of one word every time, which is euphoria. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> you covered, covered. No, nope, <laughs> I, I got nothing. <laughs> this is a hard one. Okay. The word is eucalyptus. Oh. As in the tree that's mostly associated with koalas. Yeah, so it's got those seed things that are hard to open. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why it's called covered. I guess it's because of that. Maybe because the seeds were covered. Or it could be because the tree covers the ground. I don't know. (laughs) But it comes from the Greek kaluptos, meaning covered. Sure. Emily, your next thing is good omen. Good omen. Mm -hmm. Is that one euphoria? It is not. Yeah, that makes sense. But I like that you keep guessing that. (laughs) (laughs) It's really the only one I can think of every time. (laughs) That's okay. I'll give this one to you because I have a feeling you're going to have some luck in the next round, okay? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Good Omen translates directly from euphemism. Euphemism. As in a word or phrase used to replace a less nice saying. Sure. That comes from the Greek feme, meaning prophetic voice or rumor or reputation. That's interesting that euphemism means omen interesting your last uh, question ever probably yeah probably. is <laughs> emily what does bearing well translate directly from that's what euphoria means <laughs> <laughs> at least i hope it does yes that is what euphoria <laughs> translates directly from so euphoria oh, means uh, the intense feeling of happiness and it it comes from the ancient greek pharaoh meaning to bear or to carry, as in one is carrying good feelings. Oh, that's nice. That's nice, right? And this was a nice word. It was a nice word. I hope that this has given euphoric feelings to all of those at home. I know for a fact it hasn't given that to our producer, (laughs) (laughs) who's writing a letter of termination for himself right now. (laughs) Yes. But uh, quick before it's too late, remember that you can find Butter No Parsnips <laughs> on social media, on Facebook, and on Instagram at Butter No Parsnips Podcast. And if you liked today's episode and 
I'm not sure if you did, but if you did, you can consider giving us a five-star rating or a review wherever you heard us. And if you really liked today's episode, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. Uh, donating $5 or more earns you a shout out either on social media or here on the podcast. So thank you so much to everyone who donates and everyone who listens because you're all helping us make this thing. Yeah, we think you're eurythmic. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I've been Kyle Imperator. And I've been Emily Moyers. And this has been Butter No Parsnips. Thank you for listening to Butter No Parsnips. Butter No Parsnips is produced by Seth Glicksman, Emily Moyers, and Kyle Imperator. The theme music and additional music is by Kyle Imperator. If you liked listening to this episode, subscribe and give us a good rating and or positive review wherever you heard it. If you really liked listening, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. There you can get bonus content you can't get anywhere else, like the monthly Patreon-exclusive podcast Buttered Parsnips. Your support means the world to us and encourages us to keep making more. Thanks in advance, and we'll be back next week.